Excellent. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly. I'm a program coordinator with Burlington Green. And thank you so much for joining us tonight for the Mystique of, of Owls, an introduction to owling in Ontario with our special guest speaker, Bob Bell. Um, this event is running or going to run about an hour long, maybe a few minutes longer than that. Um, it is being recorded. So if you need to run, you can't stay for the whole thing. Um, just know it is going to be recorded and we're going to send um, a link so you can watch it after if you want to rewatch it or you missed it or anything like that. Um, before we get started, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. And this land acknowledgement relates to where Burlington Green does its work in Burlington, Ontario. Though we do encourage you, if you're joining us from somewhere else, to do your own land acknowledgement for where you are. As stewards of the earth, we have the responsibility to honor and respect the four directions, land, waters, plants, animals, and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We honor all the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people who've been living on the land since time immemorial, and we recognize their leadership in protecting and caring for Mother Earth. In Burlington, our work with the community takes place within the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, represented by Treaty 14 and 19, and on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, Ottawandaran, and Haudenosaunee and Métis people. We honor these rightful caretakers of the sacred land surrounding the Great Lakes, and we're grateful for their teachings. We are each encouraged to continually learn from and about the Indigenous community where we live, and how we can meaningfully honor the calls to action for truth and reconciliation. Welcome everyone to this Zoom webinar tonight. Um, you'll see um, that we have a Q&A available at the bottom of the screen. We ask that you have, if if you have any questions to put those in the Q&A, you can use the chat feature to say hello, to interact with other people attending today, but it's really important if you have questions, please put those in the chat, in the Q&A, otherwise they may not be seen if they're in the chat. And we are hopefully going to have a couple minutes at the end to be able to um, ask any questions that come up. Um, and we'll do that at the end after, um, after Bob has finished his speaking. And I'm just about ready to pass things over to Bob, but some of you may have seen him before. He joined us last year and did an excellent webinar on an introduction to birding in Hamilton and Burlington. Um, that is available to watch if you're interested. It's on our Burlington Green YouTube channel, so you can catch that there. But if you haven't um, met Bob before, I'm gonna give a brief introduction. So Bob, uh, Bob Bell spent 35 years as a mineral exploration geologist before retiring to Ancaster in 2015. He quickly discovered that the area with its multitude of habitats and environments was fantastic for birding. Bob is passionate about, about sharing the joy of birding with people of all skill levels and enjoys introducing them to the huge variety of beautiful birds that can be seen in Hamilton and Burlington. He hopes that his passion will inspire viewers to take a new or an increased interest in the sights and sounds of nature that surround us, and that this interest will translate into support for efforts to have Burlington and Hamilton designated as bird-friendly cities. So without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Bob. I know he's got a PowerPoint presentation he's going to get set up, so we'll just give him a moment to get ready. There we go. Thank you, Kelly, and You're thank you, Bob. Thank you, Burlington Green, for the opportunity to come back and share my crazy passion for birds and birding. And thank you, audience, for attending. Um, this, uh, this meme was floating around on the internet in the last couple of months, and I thought it was a, a really good way to start off. Because my goal is by the time I'm done, I would hope that uh, you might know the proper names of some of these birds that they're not hoot owls or night owls or horny owls or plastic bags. And, and the little small ones are not baby owls. They are their own species. So we'll see how we go and, and reevaluate at the end. Uh, I should mention um, the photos are all mine, uh, other than where I indicate otherwise. So th this is a barred owl. And many of you might be familiar with the old English nursery rhyme a wise old owl sat in an oak. The more he saw, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't we be all like that wise old bird? And I would ask you to pay particular attention to this barred owl. 
and think about as we go forward, what's different about him? What makes him, him or her look, in my opinion, even wiser than some of the other ones? And if you think you know, you have an answer, uh, feel free to throw that uh, into the chat line. Uh, but my, my birding friends, you can't play. That's not, that's not fair. So what is it about owls? Yeah, I mean, historically, humans have been fascinated by owls forever. It wasn't just since Harry Potter got them into popular culture. In, in my opinion, it's because they're the birds with forward looking eyes. I mean, we can look them in the face and look them in the eye. And we are literally hardwired to be attracted to large wide eyes and big pupils and our own pupils dilate. So you can look into the face of an owl and it's like looking into a soul. Uh, amazing. Um, folklore from many, many cultures um, has attributed wisdom to owls. Not always, but, but it's mostly wisdom. And that kind of begs the question that, you know, a, a group of owls is called a parliament. And is, that why, uh, is that why they're considered wise? Because it's a parliament or, you know, given the status of politics around the world these days, these, I, uh, <clears throat> I beg to differ. But that's another story. So this is a great horned owl. And uh, you know, like I say, throughout history and through many, many different cultures, people have, have regarded owls with fascination and awe. But the strange thing is it's, it's often very contradictory. Owls have been feared, but they've been venerated, you know, despised and admired, considered wise, but also foolish, uh, associated with, with medicine, but also witchcraft and uh, associated with, uh, with wisdom. And so, you know, we, uh, we have a real conundrum about what the role of owls is. But, you know, when I say we've been thinking about them forever, this is a long-eared owl and it's my favorite owl. There's a, a cave painting in what's now uh, modern France of a long-eared owl and the painting has been dated at over 32,000 years. So people have been fixated by owls for a long time. Um, in early Roman days, uh, a dead owl would be nailed to the door to ward off evil or lightning. And believe it or not, this, this was perpetuated right into the 1800s in, in England. Supposedly, if you heard an owl hoot, that forewarned imminent death. And supposedly, this is what happened right before Julius Caesar and Augustus met their, uh, their end. Uh, in the Middle Ages of, of Europe, um, owls were considered to be associates of witches. Uh, their eerie calls filled people with a feeling of evil or imminent death. And, you know, some of their calls are pretty creepy at night. Uh, in Japan, owl pictures and figurines have been placed in homes to ward off famines or epidemics, which I find interesting because given that COVID continues to linger along, maybe we all need an owl or at least a picture of an owl in our house. Uh, here's a snowy owl. Um, in North American uh, indigenous culture, uh, there's many diverse beliefs about, about owls, including supernatural knowledge and divination and them being a symbol of protection and of fertility. Uh, with the advent of, of basically modern science developing in the 1700s, a lot of the old myths died off and, and owls were sort of returned to their position as a, a symbol of wisdom. But, you know, old myths die hard. And, and even to this day in West Africa, the common name for now is the witch bird. I came across this fascinating tidbit, the Mandarin phrase for owl, and I apologize because I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, Mao Tao Ying, um, but translated into English is cat-headed hawk. And that's a brilliant description. And this uh, owl sitting in the tree here, if you didn't know any better, you'd swear that was, that was a cat hiding in the tree. That, that was my first ever picture of a long-eared owl. And he sure looks like a cat to me. So owls are uh, global in distribution. They occur in every continent except Antarctica. And they occupy very diverse habitats. So that, you know, we get them in our typical mixed uh, deciduous coniferous forests here in southern Ontario, uh, to rainforests, to grasslands, deserts, and even, even tundras. There's 243 species of owls in the world. We're lucky enough to have 16 of them here in Canada. 
Um, the most widely distributed owl in the world is the barn owl. So I'm just using uh, the barn owl global map as an example of how broad their distribution is around the world. Uh, but I will not be talking about them tonight because um, they're essentially extirpated in Ontario, which means extinct in Ontario. Um, we're, we're considered to have 10 owls that can breed in Ontario, and one of them is, is, is the barn owl. So I'm going to do the nine and, and not the barn owl. And then we have two potential visitors, a snowy owl, which is quite regular in the winters, and quite rare, uh, a burrowing owl, which I won't talk about it. So in total, we're going to do nine breeding owls and snowy owls as visitors. 10 hours. So what makes owls so special? What makes them unique? I call them their, their superpowers. And I'll go through a series of, of superpowers. And, and number one is that they have completely silent flight. Uh, first off, their wings are very large relative to their body mass. And this allows them to fly unusually slow so they can fly and hunt and listen. Um, but they've evolved these comb-like serrations on the leading edge of their wings, and they break up the, the sound of the, the turbulent air that would typically make the whooshing flap flap sound of, of the wing. And then they've got further muffling um, on the trailing edge of the wing as well. I was lucky enough to take uh, a course on owls taught by Chris Early at the uh, Guelph Arboretum a few years ago. And, and Chris demonstrated he had the wing of a red-tailed hawk and one from a great horned owl. You know, and he flapped the, the red tail hawk wing and he whoosh, 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 whoosh. And then he took the great horned owl and he was just beating it as hard as he could. And you could not hear a thing. It was totally silent. It was just, it was amazing. Their next superpower is their vision. Their eyes are as large as ours, but set up obviously in a much, much, much smaller skull. But I should point out, our eyes are round, theirs are not. Their eyes are tubular or cylindrical. But if our eyes were as big as theirs in proportion to our skull, we would look like this boy. That, that's, that's the size of eyes we'd have. So as a result, their night vision is considered to be anywhere from 10 to 100 times better than a human's. So the, the story that Chris told was that if you had an owl in the Sky Dome or the Rogers Center, and the only light in the whole building was a candle on the pitcher's mound. You could release a mouse on the field and the owl would be able to see it from anywhere in the stadium on the basis of that candle. So pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, this, this, thanks to Kathy Foxcroft of the Owl Foundation for giving me this photo to use. And I'll, I'll talk about the foundation later. This is a, a great horned owl skull. So you can see how big the eye sockets are relative to the skull. And you also get a sense that they are cylindrical. But the downside of this, their eyes are so huge, there's no room left in their skull for muscles big enough to allow them to turn their eyes. You know, we can do side eye and look around. Owls have to turn their heads. They can't, they can't rotate their eyes. So this is why they move their heads around to see. Well, guess what? They have another superpower. They have a nice flexible neck, which allows them to do that. We uh, lowly humans have seven vertebrae in our neck. They have 14. So this allows a lot more uh, flexibility. I often hear people say, well, owls can turn their heads 360 degrees. Well, obviously that's not true or, or they'd strangle themselves, but they can turn their heads 270 degrees. And what that means is they can look over one shoulder, turn their head over one shoulder and see out over the other shoulder. And when they're doing that, they actually are cutting off blood vessels to the brain. So they have developed little pocket reservoirs of pocket blood in their brain so they don't pass out and they, they can keep functioning. And again, this is all because they can't rotate their eyes. A cute little Gary Larson cartoon that uh, Kathy provided me. Uh, another superpower is their hearing. And before I get into their ears, I just want to point out, you know, you'll hear great horned owl and long-eared owl, but those aren't ears or horns. Those are just tufts of feathers. And they actually are used for uh, camouflage, trying to look more like branches and, and trunks of trees. And they, they can use them for signaling between birds. Um, their ears are on the sides of their heads like ours, 
they have, most of them have big facial discs and those act as like a radar dish to funnel the sound into their ears. But the key to their hearing is their ears are asymmetrical and it, it, they're asymmetrical in two different ways. This is a Northern Sawwood owl and I'm not sure if it shows very well, but one ear is at the back of the head and one's closer to the front and one's higher up and one's lower. And so what this means is the owls are hearing in 3D because their brain senses it's taking longer for the sound to come to this ear than that one, so they can triangulate. And this is really important when you're trying to pinpoint a mouse under a foot of snow and you can't see it. So it, it, it's absolutely amazing. When you stop and think about it, if we are trying to pinpoint a sound, you know, I know I'm guilty of this, I'll tilt my head, tip my head back and forth, you're trying to make your hearing asymmetrical without realizing what you're doing. It, for, for the owls, this is a built-in feature. Um, you know, and, and the one, they're not, they don't all have this. The one exception is the Northern Hawk Owl, which is quite a unique owl, and we'll go into detail when we get, get to it. Um, when it comes to catching those mice under the snow, they, they have very flexible feet. You can see this is a barred owl. You can see how deadly the talons are looking. But most birds have three forward pointing toes and one back. Owls can rotate one of the forward toes back so that when they're swooping in on prey, they actually have two talons above and two below. And that gives them a much better chance of snagging a mouse that they can't see. You know, at least they're gonna get a hook into it somewhere and catch it. And I find it really interesting, uh, sort of what you call convergent evolution. Osprey, which are known as fishhawks, had the very same feature. And it, when you think about it, uh, an osprey diving down after a fish in the water, that fish isn't where it looks to be because of the refraction of light. So it gives him a better chance of, of catching that fish as well. The, the, probably the ultimate superpower that most people are aware of is that they are the masters of disguise. Now you can Google owl disguise and you're gonna see far better amazing pictures than I've got because you know, there's pictures with the owl, it's just it's right there up against the trunk and you can't see it, just blending right in. But hopefully some of my shots are instructive. So here's a great horned owl just sitting up against the trunk of the tree. No leaves around, so he's sitting right in the open, but I bet you a lot of folks would walk right by him. If you're not paying attention, he's, he's kind of blending in with, with the trunk. And you know, here, here's a great horned owl from behind. Again, sitting out in the open, but look at how the, the markings on his back feathers and tail mimic the bark. Very well camouflaged. <clears throat> uh, Eastern screech owls, they nest in, in, in cavities and trees and will often sit out at the edge of the, the nesting cavity. So here's a, an Eastern screech owl and don't despair, I, I've even pointed them out for you, but if you can't see them at this scale, uh, next shot is zoomed in. There you go. And, and there he is, blending right in. And yet he's sitting right out in plain sight. So whenever people say to me, you know, well, how come I never see an owl? I say, if you do any walking in the woods, in around a cemetery, a, a golf course, botanical gardens, I guarantee you, you walk right by them. They're there. They're, they're probably just as common as red-tailed hawks, but they're very elusive. So these are the, the 10 owls we're gonna go through. Oops, uh, sorry. And uh, I just would wanna stop here for a second and, and say that all of the range maps I'm using were created by a fellow named Terry Soul. Terry lives in South Dakota. He runs a really interesting uh, blog and he has created all these uh, range maps. And we follow each other on Twitter. So I reached out to him and asked permission. And he was very pleased that they would be used for you know, sort of educational purposes. But having said that, I'm deliberately using his range maps of just North America, even though many of our owls are much more global than just North America. They're just the great horned owl, for example, lives down in the South America. Many of the owls are over in the, you know, Eurasia. But I want you to be able to see in better detail what, where they are in, in Ontario. So we'll, we'll, I'm keeping with North American map. So we start with the great horned owl. <coughs> Excuse me. It's our largest common owl in North America. It's the classic hoot owl, deep booming hoot. 
And typical pose is high up in a tree in a horizontal branch tucked up against the trunk, often in a white pine or a spruce tree. They, they're nocturnal, but they're very active at dusk and dawn. And one of the best ways of finding them is pay attention if you're hearing crows or blue jays going ballistic. I mean, you hear nonstop crowing. I have found, I think, three great horned owls now by, by following the crows. And in, in one case, there was crows um, on, on, on a crow on, on a tree uh, on either side of a spruce tree, and they were calling, looking in at that spruce tree. So I just looked to where they were looking, and there was this poor crow, uh, great horned owl trying to sleep, and, and the crows were trying to drive them out. Okay, uh, they live in a, a variety of deciduous, coniferous, or mixed forests, but they almost always have some open habitat, uh, such as uh, a farm field, wetland, or pasture. So they're uh, a bird that is really adapted to humans. They, they, they've, they've thrived on the fragmented habitats that we've created, because the clearings are, are areas for mice and prey. Uh, so they, they really are urban owls. They're not just out in the forest. You can, like I said earlier, you can look in cemeteries, large city parks, golf courses, uh, botanical gardens. See in here, you can get a good look at these uh, horns or tufts of feathers. They can take prey as large as 30 pounds, uh, you know, say a, a great blue heron. Um, and they can take prey as small as a cat. But I, I do want to point out that owls don't recognize little dogs and cats as prey. They do not deliberately target them as prey. If they take one, it's a case of mistaken identity. They thought it was a rabbit or something similar, or they're really hurting. They're, they're really hungry and desperate. Uh, during that course that Chris early put on, they brought in a few species of owls. So this was a great horned owl they brought in. Uh, get the sense of scale when he's on the, the handler's uh, arm and you can see the heavy, heavy, thick leather glove he's wearing to protect himself from those talons. This was a, a nest uh, in Burlington uh, a few years ago. And uh, they, they don't build their own nests. They, they will utilize the nest of other birds such as a red-tailed hawk, an American crow, or a great blue heron. And it's not that they drive out those birds out and steal their nest. It's the, the nests are sitting empty because the great horned owls start nesting very, very early. They are earliest nesting birds. A bonded pair will actually start calling each other in December. Um, un unmated pairs will, will be calling in January and they're all sitting on eggs or nests by late January or February. And, and why so early? It's because they have one of the longest parenting sessions of any birds. It's seven months of parenting from egg to fledging. And you compare that to the lightning speed of our little chipping sparrows in the summer that are 12 days. You lay an egg and 12 days later, youngsters gone and moved on. Um, I don't know if you can see it. There's a youngster sitting underneath mom uh, on, on the slide here on the right hand side. When they're really young, they really are Muppet babies. They're, they're really cute. The, the parents, if they, if they get hurt and they end up at a rehab center and they can't be released into the wild, uh, they can be, make great surrogate parents. Uh, one female in captivity over the course of her lifetime uh, played surrogate mother to over 100 owlets that had been orphaned or abandoned. Uh, here, here's that pair in Burlington again, a little bit bigger than those Muppet babies. And here's a different nest with some bigger ones. And it looks like they had rabbit on the menu. So now we move on to Eastern screech owls. And I should be pointing out the first three owls we're doing a great horned Eastern screech and barred. You can see in the range map, the pink is, is year round residence. So these three are, are with us all year round, summer and winter. You can see the Eastern screech is basically occupying the, the Southeast quadrant of North America. Uh, the Western uh, US has their own Western screech owl. And you can see ours doesn't go that far into Northern Ontario, looks to be up around Sudbury or so. They're much smaller than you might think. They're not much bigger than a robin, but with much longer wings. Um, and as a result, the, the, you can understand why people, if they see one out of the, out of the hidey hole, it, it, you might think it is a baby great horned owl. 
But if you get a good look at it, one way you can tell them apart is the screech owls, their beak is bone white and the great horns are black, even when they're chicks or you know, owlets. Um, they come in two different color flavors called morphs. Uh, our, the ratio, most of, of uh, one third of our owls are typically red morphs and about two thirds are gray. Uh, there are the odd rare sort of uh, intermediate brown morphs as well. My understanding uh, is that the color is genetic and permanent and a, a red morph could mate with a gray morph and then the offspring could be one color or the other. Uh, when I talk about them being a master of disguise, uh, the red morphs, if, if they're given the opportunity, they will choose a tree with redwood to, uh, to the roost in, like this guy has. And the gray ones are in gray wood, a tree with gray wood. And sometimes you get super lucky. And thank you so much to my friend Joanne Redwood. She got this spectacular picture of a, a pair, a presumably mated pair of a red morph and a gray morph together. Just a, a, an Audubon shot. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, they're nocturnal, but they will occasionally hunt in the daylight, like this one I got lucky enough to see. Uh, and like great horns, they're common in most types of woods, and they're urban or rural. They've adapted very well. People get them in their backyards. They're often more heard than seen. And I would really encourage people to uh, Google the sound of an Eastern screech owl because their one call sounds exactly like a horse whinnying. And we have a woodlot right next to us here and I've gone out at night and it is, it is creepy. When you hear these horses whinnying in the bush. Uh, they often sit at the entrance to their, I call it their hidey hole, their, their uh, nesting cavity during the day uh, but, you know, especially like in a, a sunny a winter day, late afternoon when this low sun angle is right in on the hole, that's when they seem to really like to sit out and, and soak up the sun. And they, this, it's kind of creepy. They will utilize uh, nesting boxes. And so if anyone's interested in a do-it-your-own kit, I happen to have the, uh, I have plans that you, you could follow to build your own. And I'm gonna be giving my email address at the end and just uh, contact me and I can email you the, the file. So this brings us to our third uh, year round resident is the barred owl. Uh, you can see it does go out uh, to Western North America, but in actual fact, it didn't before mankind opened up corridors of roads across the Rocky Mountains. Out there is the endangered spotted owl. And since the bard have moved in out there, they're kind of out competing them and out breeding, they're interbreeding. And the offspring, they're often called sparred, sparred owl, a combination of spotted and bard. So it brings me back to the question I asked about this wise old owl. And the answer is, it's our only owl that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, it's got black eyes, all the rest have yellow eyes. And those black eyes, in, in my opinion, just really does enhance that look of wisdom. Uh, again, here's, here's uh, Bard Owl that was brought in during the, uh, the course at the Arboretum. You can see they're a little bit smaller than, than the Great Horned Owl. Uh, they get their name from, they get their vertical barring uh, on, their, on their breast and chest. And then it's topped off by horizontal barring. And it gives me the image. It looks like a big fluffy scarf thrown around their throat. Uh, they live in mixed mature forests. There's often a bit of water nearby. And th this is another owl that I would encourage you to Google their sound because the mnemonic for it, and it's very distinctive. It sounds like who, who, who cooks for you? Who cooks for y'all? And uh, Kelly was lucky enough to see one last week in Algonquin, and I don't know if you heard it calling Kelly, but it, it's pretty neat. Now, th these are owls that, that uh, um, non-birders will, will, will seem to find occasionally because they will sit out during the daytime on a perch, maybe just above your head height, 15 feet up, uh, looking up and down a trail, doing a bit of hunting or, or just resting. So you know, pay attention and look up a bit because you never know when you're walking right underneath one of these guys. Um, I got really lucky one day I was driving um, and when I saw this, my peripheral vision, I saw this swoosh. I slammed on the brakes and got out and this barred owl had dropped out of a tree and caught this metal hole. 
And then I got really lucky because he took it up, he or she took it up into the tree and posed for me. You know, and I can't believe the picture is even semi in focus because I, I, I have to admit, I was trembling a little bit, I was so excited. So now, now we get into um, some owls that do migrate, um, will come south in the winter, starting with the long-eared owl. So the pink is where they're, they're breeding and blue is where they might come in the winter. And I'll, I'll make the generic comment for the this and the next two owls, long-eared, short-eared, and northern sawwit. You're going to see that it shows that they're year-round residents here in Southern Ontario. I've never seen any of them in the summer. Winter is really the best time to see them. Maybe it's because there's a lot more of them that they've come, they've come south. Uh, they're my favorite owl. I, I just think they're gorgeous. They often have a, a rather startled, uh, surprised expression on their face. And it, it may be enhanced by their, their big ear tufts that, that look like exclamation points sticking straight up. Here's one that's just about to launch and go off hunting right at dusk. This is the more typical view. I was working my way around these dense spruce trees looking and uh, came around the bend. And this is what I saw to my naked eye, uh, the arrows indicating where he is. So I don't know how well that shows on, on the screen, but I'll, I'll zoom in. There, there's what I got zoomed in. And then I walked on, I didn't hang around. Okay, you can see two uh, um, long-eared owls in this shot. These are birds that will roost communally. They congregate in the winter. And in fact, there's a town in Northern Serbia called Kikinda, which is a self-proclaimed world owl capital. And right in their town square, every winter, they have anywhere from 750 to 1,000 long-eared owls. What an amazing sight. You can Google it and you'll see pictures of just a tree with a hundred owls sitting there. It's amazing. And in the surrounding countryside, there's up to another 30,000 that community roosts. I don't know what's special about there, but I'd sure love to go and uh, check it out. Uh, here's a shot I took uh, in the greater Hamilton area late last year. You can see there's two of them together. And I don't know if you can see well, but the upper one is sitting with a rather barrel chested view. And the lower one look, looks like it's a smaller owl. It looks skinnier. Well, what this is actually telling you in body language is the upper one is, is whatever he is, is, is relaxed. He's not concerned about me. When owls go tall and thin, that's a defensive pose. That they're a bit nervous. They're trying to disappear and make themselves look like a, a branch or a, a trunk of a tree. So I, I, I zoomed in and there's the one that's gone tall and thin and, and I moved on. But to my, to my defense for being too close to these guys, they were about 20 feet off a busy trail with joggers and dog walkers. So they didn't pick the best place to, uh, to roost. Okay, now we move on to the short-eared owl. And you can see they've got a huge extensive breeding range all the way from Newfoundland to Alaska and, and down below the Great Lakes. And then you can see they go south well down even into these are what I call my nemesis bird, my nemesis owl, because I've never been able to get great shots like this. So my birding friend, Deb Johnson, uh, hats off, Deb, thank you very much for providing these photos and letting me use them. Um, you can see their so-called ears certainly are short compared to the long ears. I, it seems like these guys all have their ears down a little bit more because they are often a little bit taller than that. Uh, they've been called the grass owl because they are a bird of open country, grasslands, prairies, meadows, tundras, and marshes, which may explain why they've got such a huge range from Newfoundland to Alaska. But because of habitat loss, they actually are considered a threatened species here in Canada. Um, I call them the Alice Cooper of owls with that dark mascara. It's just, it, it's really striking. Um, they typically come out hunting in late afternoon, uh, but you can also, you know, you can get lucky and see them any time of the day. They fly low to the ground and their flight pattern has been uh, likened to a moth. They, they kind of fly like a moth and they're very good at hovering. Um, here, Deb got a great shot of one uh, swallowing down lunch and they nest on the ground, which makes sense being a grass owl. And now you can tell we're back to my pictures. Thanks, thanks, Deb, for those. 
Uh, this is at um, Amherst Islands. And like long-eared owls, short-eared owls will congregate and communally roost during the winter. And there's actually, I, I think there's six or seven in this shot. It's, you can see the four up in the posts, but there's a few more that I can see up close that are down in, in the grass. And uh, some winters at the meadow vole population is really high on uh, Amherst Island. It could be a really good place for uh, various raptors, including the short-eared owls. Now that brings us to the Northern Sawwood Owl. And see it once again, it shows it year round in Southern Ontario, but the best time of year to see them is now. And I'm proud to say, I just took this picture two days ago here in the uh, greater Hamilton area. And does he or she not look to be pretty proud of itself for having that catch of the day, some sort of mouse. So to me, they've gotta be the cutest little murder bird on the planet. They're the size of a pop can. Now, supposedly the name saw wet is derived from some of their vocalizations, which has been likened to the sound of if you're sharpening a knife for a saw on a whetstone. But I've also read that it could be derived from the French word sawet, which means little owl. So both make sense, and you know, I, I don't know the, the, the true uh, origin. Uh, there used to be a banding station, uh, only about a half hour drive from my home here in Ancaster, and they had an open house one night, and they caught a couple, so we got to see them up close and personal, and you can just see when they're in hand how tiny they are. You know, very cute little bird to be a, a murder bird, but um, one thing uh, I just want to point out in advance is notice the top of their head is stippled, because we're going to be coming to the superficially similar boreal owl. Uh, boreal owls have spotting on their head, not, not, not striping. Uh, this is a more typical view. You're not going to see someone holding one in their hand. You're going to go out looking around pine trees, and they're, they're often tucked in really deep and really hard to see. Um, they, but they, they roost surprisingly low. I've seen them as low as, as right at eye level, um, and, and for anywhere from there up to maybe three or four meters up in the tree. Uh, sometimes you get lucky and they do um, roost right out in broad daylight, again, hiding in plain sight. Hard to see this one, but just like the great horned owl, he's sitting up against the trunk of the tree. But when you zoom in, I mean, there he is, uh, trying to sleep. And I want to mention right now before I forget, you see these owls that are asleep, don't be fooled. He knows I'm standing there. They always know you're there. There's no owl that's tricking them. You're not going to get away with it. They know you're there. Uh, but being a really nocturnal owl, these guys need to be sleeping all day. So you don't want to spend much time with them and, and be disturbing them. Here's one that I stumbled upon by chance, clearly woke him up, hence the big eyes open. So I you know, snapped the shot and moved on and get back to sleep. Uh, one of the best ways to find these is, is it, it's very similar to listening to jays and crows trying to mob great horned owls. Chickadees will do the same with saw wets. If you hear chickadees just going ballistic, the louder and more emphatic and the more D, 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 they're really, look, look around and see what's got them agitated. They, you know, they're wound up about something and there's a very good chance it's a solid owl. Okay, now this brings us to the Northern Hawk Owl. Uh, you can see it, it's a, a bird of the boreal forests. Uh, it does not come down in the Southern Ontario unless it's a vagrant. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're much further north and they're a very unique owl. They got, they're well named because at first blush, especially if you're looking at it from a distance, you might think this was a hawk or a falcon. Um, their wings are more pointed, allows them to fly a lot faster. They get a long tail, they fly like a hawk. They often perch like a hawk at the, at the tip of uh, trees. Um, but what makes them different? These guys are not nocturnal. These guys are diurnal, they hunt during the day. And as a result, they don't rely on hearing as much as the other owls. They still use it, but they're, they don't have the prominent facial discs. They don't have the asymmetrical ears. Their ears are like us. And they don't have the sound muffling on their wings. Their, their wings are just as loud as a hawk's. They're unusually tame. They don't seem to be fussed about people. And this is probably because they live so far north, they rarely encounter humans. So 
So, you know, they just don't recognize us as a potential threat. I, I mentioned sometimes they come down as a vagrant. Well, two winters ago, this particular one showed up uh, in Schaumburg, which is near the Holland Marsh in King Township. And it thrived in that marsh over, over much of the winter, it remained for months and lots of birders got great experience seeing a very rare owl. And I can guarantee you that Tim Hortons and Schaumburg never had such good business as, as that winter. And it certainly didn't know who was the king. I mean, there he is up on their, their banner on, on the street. And I find Northern Hawk Owls have a lot of comical expressions and I was certainly getting the look from this one. Well, this brings us to the great gray owl. Another boreal bird, circumpolar, but you can see it doesn't go far into Quebec. Uh, they've often been called the phantom of the north. They're probably the owl that's most coveted by birders because they're, you know, you have to go to them. It's so rare to, to see them here. And they are a circumpolar bird. Now, forgive me for this creepy looking shot because it looks like his head is caving in. It was a very windy day. These are our largest owl by dimension, but not even close by weight. They are all feathers. And in actual fact, his skull, their skull tops out if you draw a line, right above the eyes. So that skull is, is ending right there and, and, and coming down there. So everything above that is just feathers. Oh, I took this from Wikipedia. And you can see the, the actual size of the body of the owl superimposed. They're about 70% feathers. Um, these guys are primarily nocturnal, but in the winter in particular, they, they do a lot of hunting in the daytime. And it, it often allows birders some, some great looks at them. They're long lived birds. Captives have lived up to 40 years, abandoned one in the wild, which is actually in Alberta. It was around 19 years old. Uh, this is probably my, <clears throat> excuse me, my owl shot that I am most proud of. I was with my sister, Barb. Uh, we were driving around uh, near Kekebeka Falls, west of Thunder Bay. And, you know, the combination of hoarfrost on the white pine and the weather beaten stump and the sort of pensive look on him, I just, this was a calendar shot. I just, I just love this photo. But that same bird then flew up on a wire and we had a moment, you know, we had a great look. So you can see how you're, you're just fixated looking into their eyes. I, I, I got lucky again two years ago. Um, this was in Algoma in Thessalon. I was actually standing on the shoulder of the Trans-Canada Highway. And I watched this great gray uh, catch this meadow vole and swallow it. And it was just magical to watch him. And they always take them down head first because I think the brains apparently are very uh, nutritious. They like that first. And then, okay, now we're into the boreal owl. Um, you know, again, a well-named bird because you can see it's, it's quite far north. They're small, but, they're, but they are larger than the saw wet and the screech owls. You can see it sort of looks like the saw wets, but, but, but not really. Notice the spotting, for example, instead of the stripes. Um, over in Eurasia, they're called tenements owl, but it's the same, same species. Uh, many thanks to my friend Tony. Tony Ward lives in, in Thessalon. Tony found this bird uh, a couple of years ago and got some great shots and was kind enough to allow me to use it. And uh, I do want to take an aside to just a general comment on birding. Um, Tony's one of the best rare bird finders I know. I mean, he's a great birder, but Tony does his birding primarily by bicycle. So not this day because it was a very wintry, blasty day. But by being out on a bike, he's not making as much cars, uh, as much noise as a car would, but he can also hear and see a lot more. So he's much more observant. And Terry, uh, Tony's got a whole string of firsts and rarities for Algoma. So if you ever want to become a real top birder like Tony, uh, take up a bicycle. Uh, another shot by, by Tony. Uh, so, uh, Boreal's roost a little bit higher than saw wets, around five to seven meters up. Uh, they will cache extra prey in the winter, and if it freezes, they'll sit on it and thaw it out. And people that were observing the northern hawk owl in Schaumburg saw the same thing. The Inuit called them the blind one because of their tameness during daylight. And Inuit children apparently have even made them pets. 
And again, I, I suspect it's because they so rarely see people. They just, they don't realize that we're a potential threat. Okay, and then finally, um, we are lucky enough to actually have our first boreal owl in the Hamilton area in 24 years. Uh, our good friend, Barry Combs, Barry Coombs, and Barry's been acting as the co-chair of a bird friendly city committee, which we'll touch on later, found this, this one and photographed it and was kind enough to allow me to use the photo. Thanks, Barry. And then, you know, I'm embarrassed to say, I've never seen a boreal owl. So here I am talking about them. I, I actually went looking for Tony's in, in Thessalon. I went looking for uh, berries here, never found them. And then my high school friend, Paul Sullivan, calls me the other day and he's got one in, in his driveway in the soup. So <laughs> talk about luck of the draw. Great yard, but bird Paul, and thanks for the fantastic picture. And then finally, we come to the snowy owl. Uh, you can see that they really are a bird of the tundra, the, the very high Arctic above tree line. That's where they breed up in the pink. The blue is where they might come down in the winter, but I have neighbors of a place in Florida and they've seen them as far south as Florida. Um, in the Arctic, the Inuit called them ukpik. And up there, they eat primarily lemmings up to uh, about 1600 a year. Uh, they are an eruptive bird, which means they will move south in winters in search of food. Uh, but conventional thinking would be, well, it's because they're starving and they've had to come south. Well, it's actually the opposite. It's, it's counterintuitive what you might think. Um, their life cycle is geared to the life cycle of the lemmings. And when the lemming population's really up, the snowies are much more successful at being able to raise to maturity uh, more eggs and, you know, and uh, outlets making it all the way to adulthood. So then that following winter, there's a ton more owls and they just need to spread out more to, to find food. So when they come down this way in a big way, it's, it's actually a good thing. They've had a good reproductive year. Uh, so it seems like they become an annual winter visitor the, down in Southern Ontario around the Great Lakes. When they're here, they eat a variety of things like rats and muskrats, they like ducks fish, even uh, great blue herons. Uh, there's a general rule of thumb that the older mature males are the really pure snowy white ones. And this is certainly the whitest snowy owl I'd ever seen. So I'm presuming that's, that's quite an old male. And then the rule of thumb is the younger, um, the females and younger birds of either sex have this barring, more camouflage on it. But I've also been told that from folks at the Owl Foundation, this is not definitive. You can't bank on that. There's always exceptions. But, but as a general rule of thumb, Pierce Snow White's probably an old male. Uh, they have feathers, you can see they come right down over their feet. And as a result, they are our heaviest owl. So even though dimension wise, they're smaller than the great gray, they weigh twice as much as the great gray has those dense feathers. And nothing to do with owls, but one thing I'll better pass on that I learned the hard way. If you've got your camera on an owl or a hawk or an eagle and it's perched and you're hoping they get a great shot as it lifts off and its wings come up, don't zoom in too tight because almost instantly the wings are out of the frame of your camera and they're cut off like this. A couple of winters ago, there was a, quite a big extensive ice storm here in, in, in Southern Ontario. So you're gonna see a few pictures with a lot of ice coating everything. Uh, my good friend Kale invited me to come up and we drove uh, farm roads north of here and we saw 19 snowies in one day. It was magical. Uh, <clears throat> so unlike most owls, snowies are extremely diurnal out hunting in the daytime. Well, I mean, that makes sense. They're living at the high Arctic where it's 24 hour daylight. So as a result, they're a bit of an exception too. They're relying more on vision than on hearing. So like the Northern Hawk Owl, they don't have well-developed facial discs. And it doesn't mean they don't hear really well, but they don't have those discs. And they have a bit of sound muffling on their wings, but not as well-developed. They are counting more on speed over stealth. And so they can even catch small birds on the wing. Here's another one sitting on an icy, uh, icy tree. They nest on the ground, which is a, you have to expect because there are no trees where they're nesting, they're above tree line. And so 
surprisingly, some of them do have hints of uh, ear tufts. I hadn't known it until I, I saw a few photos and uh, I saw this bird. So where do you look around here? Well, if you live around Burlington, sometimes you don't have to go very far. Here's one at LaSalle Marina uh, Park in Burlington, sitting out on the, uh, the breakwater. And that wasn't that long ago. And here's one at the uh, Bronte Harbor uh, in Oakville uh, breakwater. It seems like every winter there's one hanging around there. But your best bet is, is to go and drive rural fields that are really, really flat. The flatter, the better, because I think it reminds them of the tundra. They feel like they're at home. So you drive farm fields and look at all the high perches, like the hydro pool. Uh, and, and bear in mind that you know, they, they are roosting a bit, nest and you know, sleeping. Uh, so some of the best areas that I've experienced are around, say, Bellwood, Shelburne, Arthur, Grand Valley area. Or a bit further north would be Minnesing, Strongville, or north of uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, that Waterloo, and just check out all those hydro poles or if there's any trees around. But don't ignore the fields. But <laughs> it's a challenge to find a white lump out in a white field, especially if you're driving and don't have a spotter with you, you try and stay on the road and look for white lumps. And the other thing you'll find distressingly is that it's amazing how many white plastic grocery bags are blowing around even in a rural farm field. I've slammed on the brakes more time thinking I'm seeing a, a snowy flying and then I get my binoculars on it and it's a garbage bag, a grocery bag. On windy days, in my experience, they're often sitting down in the windrows between the fields, uh, trying to duck out of the wind. I like this picture because I thought he looked like uh, someone had built a little snowman. So if any of you are starting to yawn, don't worry, we're, we're done our 10 owls, so I'm starting to wind it up. But um, in actual fact, all joking aside, owls don't yawn. But what owls do is they create a pellet out of the parts of their prey that they can't digest. So five or six hours after they've eaten, the fur the, of a mouse, the teeth, the skull, the bones, they get compressed into a pellet. And then they have to throw that out, or throw it up, or cast it. And it takes a few of these yawns, apparently, to, to work it up and expel it. And uh, it's a pity I didn't hang around longer, but I'd been watching this guy for a few minutes, and I just wanted to leave him be. Uh, so I missed the action. Uh, so here's a shot I stole off the internet, and I didn't keep the source, but here's one actually uh, throwing out the pellet. Uh, here's a long-eared pellet that I found, and being a geologist, of course, you have to have a scale bar. Uh, you can see it's about six or seven centimeters long. And uh, I broke into it, and you, you can see a little skull, you can see teeth, bones, and then all the fur. And th there are companies that actually sell these as little school kits for, for teachers to, to, to do it with the kids, open them up and study them. And if anyone's interested, they're not expensive. If anyone's interested, I can, I've got a link. And in fact, I know someone locally that has bought some and, and has some surplus ones that, that she could sell. So if anyone wants to play with uh, owl pellets, just let me know. So now let's go through some tips for finding owls. I, I've, I've already mentioned a few, but we'll recap them. Uh, number one is, is you look for whitewash. And whitewash is a euphemism for poop. Uh, if you have an owl or two or a bunch of them uh, roosting for any length of time in a tree, it's going to get covered in, in whitewash. You can see it on the branch here, and sometimes it drips right down onto the ground. In this case, where there's no snow, and by the way, these black things are pellets. This was a huge roost of a lot of a lot of owls. Don't get tricked by the natural gum that secretes out of a lot of conifers. That gum tends to be bluish green, bluish gray. Whitewash is really white. It's like the old fashioned white out from my typewriter days. I came across this on Monday, just two days ago. You can see the whitewash is really, really coated, uh, this branch of the spruce tree. And there's something back here in the branch. I, I don't expect you're gonna be able to see it at, that, at this scale, but I'll zoom in and show you. It's a mouse. There's a little tiny mouse. So the owl, 
has stashed a little mouse here for future consumption. And right above this whitewash was sitting a, a saw wet owl. Not the same one I showed earlier at the Moses, but the second one. So that was a really cool experience. You, you see the whitewash, you look up, see the owl, and then in behind you see his cache of food. Um, looking for great horns in particular, and they're often up high in a, a, a white pine or a spruce. Uh, I was with, uh, again, with Barry, Barry Coombs. Barry spotted this one and, and he taught me something interesting. He said, you want to look for like a little window where they, they can hide in behind, but they can sit and look out. And how Barry ever spotted this, I don't know. So this is what we saw with our, our naked eye. And it's a good example of an owl. He knows we're there, he's watching us. So this is what the naked eye, I zoomed in. You see that, and then I zoomed in full with my camera. And so it looks like we're right on top of them, but we're a long ways away. So we didn't feel like we were distressing them. You wanna scan any tree cavities, for, for especially for Eastern screech owls. And I, I would say particularly south or uh, west facing ones where you get the low angle setting sun or, or the, uh, the winter sun. That's when they're gonna come out and, and, and soak up the sun. So again, you might not see him at the scale. This was my naked eye shot and, and zoomed in, there he is. And you'll see lots of shots uh, that are even more disguised than this where, where their ears, ear tufts come right up to the top of the hole and you just, they just look like bark of the, of the tree. Sometimes you get really lucky and you see the aftermath of an owl being present. So who was here? This was, this was the pardon the pun, this was a cold case, uh, Carolyn Reed, had stumbled upon a murder scene. And Carolyn, thank you very much for allowing me to use this spectacular picture. Uh, I'm no expert, but, but when Carolyn posted it, she took this, I believe it was in Scarborough a few weeks ago. It seemed that the consensus on Facebook was that this was an Eastern screech owl that had made a face plant in presumably after a mouse. So that's a really neat shot. Thank you, Carolyn. So in summation, you got to pay attention. And just like these guys, if you haven't seen the movie, The Big Year, you got to watch it. It's a hilarious mockumentary of us birders. But you do need to be intently watching everything. If you're yakking with a friend or you've got earbuds in or a dog romping around, you're not going to see anything. You, you listen for the crows or blue jays going ballistic. They could be mobbing a big owl. You listen for the chickadees doing the same for the little owls. You look for that whitewash. You look for pellets. And you know, if there's been fresh snow overnight, a, a black pellet's gonna be sitting nicely right on top and it really stands out. Um, you wanna, you wanna uh, look for lumps on branches, especially near the trunk of the tree. You wanna scan all those cavities in the trees, like I mentioned, uh, west or south facing. And you wanna examine all those conifers carefully, look for little windows. For the snowies, you want to drive the rural roads and really flat farm ground. Okay, and you know, you'll notice I've only really given general locations for owls. Please don't ask me for specifics because I'm not going to give, uh, give them away. And besides, it's uh, way more fun to find your own owl. Now, uh, I really like this cartoon, uh, Irritable Owl Syndrome. Owl telling the guy to bugger off. I don't want to dwell on anything negative, but human behavior around owls has to be addressed. Uh, we can't help ourselves. We lose our minds when we see an owl and we end up uh, sometimes inadvertently stressing an owl out of naivety, we don't know any better, or intentionally by some photographers that, that are basically wanting a, a shot, they're disturbing the owl, wanting it to fly. So our human presence, when we're too close, we're affecting their stress level, you know, especially the ones that are nocturnal and they're trying to roost during the day. And we're causing damaging fatigue, loss of energy and sleep. And that damage, you've got to think it's, it, it's cumulative. You might say, well, I only spent two or three minutes with it or five minutes. Yeah, well, you know, what about the other 50 birders that came along and did the same? That owl didn't get much sleep all day. How would you like to be in bed surrounded by cameras pointing at you all night? So the way it's been explained to me is an owl is constantly doing a risk assessment. It's got all these people around it and it's sitting there thinking, am I in danger? Do I need to fly? If I fly, I'm gonna lose this roost. I love this roost, this is mine, I staked it out. 
I, I might lose it and not get it back. I've built up all this warm air in my feathers, got these warm air pockets. I'm gonna lose that and I'm gonna have to regenerate it. I'm gonna burn energy for nothing. I might get predated, a bigger owl or a hawk or something might, might get me. And my favorite analogy would be, you're out with friends, you're camping in a cottage or around a fire pit, fire goes out, you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and you're laying there, you still got body heat in your sleeping bag, but it's getting cold. And you think, okay, do I get out of bed, lose all my body heat and light the fire and then it'll be better? Or do I lay here, which is what I always did, and play possum and hope somebody else will get out and light the fire? So this is the sort of strategies that poor owl has to think about when, when we're out there. And then the ultimate uh, controversy is baiting. And baiting is when people throw out or even pin down a store-bought mouse to get a great shot. Uh, not guaranteed, but quite often, if you see a spectacular shot face on, the owl's looking right into the camera, the wings are out, the landing gear are up, you know, he's coming in to grab that mouse, there's a very good chance that, that he's been baited. Now, Baiting is actually not illegal. I wish it was, but it's not illegal. But, you know, in Ontario, it is illegal to feed wildlife in parks and conservation areas. And it is illegal to introduce uh, non-native species and store-bought mice aren't native. You're habituating owls to humans and, and habituating humans as food. And it's often done on the side of a road and then the, you know, you know what happens, the owl's gonna get hit by a car. And a lot of those store-bought mice are carrying lots of pathogens, salmonella, and whatnot. So it's just not, in my opinion, ethical. And is it really worth it to get a killer shot and likes on Facebook? So every winter, there's a lot of controversy on Facebook about owl pictures, to the point where now a lot of uh, uh, groups have essentially banned owl photos. You mean they, they'll say maybe in three months, like after the winter's over, when, when you know, the owls have moved on, so no one can get the location and go and harass them. Um, or they'll put them on a time delay for the administrator to, uh, to approve it. I don't want to make it sound terrible and negative of all birders, but there are certain crowds that want shots. And let's just do ethical owling and respect the birds, please. So if you want to help, if you want to help owls, I can't encourage you enough to donate to the Owl Foundation in Vineland Station. I can email you the donor form where I think Kelly might be in, in the handout, or here's their website is uh, owlfoundation.ca. It's a registered Canadian charity and it, you know, it's the oldest owl rehab center, I believe in North America. They take in injured or orphaned owls and other raptors. They've established a province-wide network of volunteer drivers and actually even have volunteer pilots if the owl's really remote. Um, and it's set up such that let's say an owl gets hit by a car in Timmins. Hopefully, you know, the, the network works that no one has to drive more than two or three hours. Maybe someone in Timmins takes it to go gamma, go gamma to Sudbury, Sudbury to Ferry Sound. And it gets handed off along the way and it ends up down at, at the facilities in Vineland, Vineland Station. And they rehab the owl and then it's taken back and released into the wild. If the injuries are too severe, as long as they're not going to be fatal, that owl ends up getting to live a very comfortable life that it wouldn't have gotten at the facilities. And it can be put to work. They might mate or they can act as a surrogate parent. Uh, so I do want to give a special shout out to Kathy uh, Foxcroft. Kathy is the business administrator at the Owl Foundation and was kind enough to take the time to review my presentation with me gave me some great feedback and, and, and really improved it. So, so thank you, Kathy. Um, if you make a donation, it's tax deductible and you can use it to sponsor an owl. So here's one we're sponsoring, uh, uh, Kaput is a short-eared owl. And of course I picked a short-eared owl because I don't have good pictures of them. I wanted to see Kaput, but you can see intake was in 2012 and it was unsuc unsuccessful healing. But here we are 10 years later. So Kaput would have died, but he said 10 years of life already that he it wouldn't have had if it wasn't for the Owl Foundation. And your donation also gets you um, an annual tour, which is absolutely fascinating. And otherwise you can't get in there because they don't want it open to the public because it would be too stressful for the owls. 
if you're looking for a bit more information uh, on owls, a couple of books I'd recommend. Um, this Hidden Lives of Owls by Lee Calves. It has a, a nice section uh, that focuses on things like mythology and culture that I touched on at the beginning, which is, which is really interesting. And I mentioned Chris early giving the course at the Guelph Arboretum. Chris has written a, a few really good uh, guide, field guide books. And, and his book, uh, Hawks and Owls of Eastern North America, is a very good book. I would also ask to encourage you to donate to Burlington Green, our sponsors. They are doing such fabulous conservancy work and you know, they would really appreciate donations. And, and here's their website to uh, do so, www.burlingtongreen.org. Uh, okay, so I mentioned that, that Kelly and I are both on the um, Hamilton Burlington Bird Friendly City Team. We're working to get the two cities certified as bird friendly by Nature Canada. Uh, to do so, the city has to set standards to protect our birds, things like banning roaming cats and, and mandating lights out on buildings, especially during migration, and not using highly reflective glass. Uh, one of the requirements we have, like, it's like in a rubric, rubric of things we have to do, is host a public poll to, to um, vote a city bird for each city. And that polling is ongoing as we speak. It, it ends on March 6th. And so I would really ask of anybody in the audience that hasn't already done so, if you are a resident of Hamilton and Burlington, or you, you, know, you work, live, or go to school there, essentially, please go into our, our website here. And again, Kelly, uh, this, is on the, this will be on your handout, so you don't need to take this down. Uh, and then look for the link for your city, and please, please vote. Uh, the more votes we get, the better um, and, and better that city council won't be able to ignore it and hopefully will ratify it to make those birds the official birds of our city. And then finally, uh, Kelly told me not to be shy. For those of you, shameless promotion, for those of you that don't know me, that I have uh, Lyme disease and it forced me into uh, a premature um, retirement whereupon I took up birding and then I very, very, very quickly discovered that when I'm birding, I'm out of my body, you know, I'm in the zone, I don't feel my aching, ailing body. And it was really therapeutic. And uh, so I kind of wrote uh, a book for myself, it was rather cathartic to put it all down. And to my shock, it's been picked up by a publishing house, a Hancock house. And I was just talking to the publisher this afternoon and it looks like it will be published in June. The, the target is for, for this June. So if anyone is interested in, you know, first off, understanding the very bizarre, strange set of symptoms that you get from Lyme, they don't seem to be connected, but like how do they all relate to the same thing? How to navigate a medical system that basically is in denial that Lyme even exists, especially chronic Lyme, like what I have. And then I go through the treatments I had, my discovery of birding, and then I basically go into uh, a birding 101 for people that want to know how to get into the birding uh, from all levels of healthness, from watching bird feeders and the types of bird feeders I recommend to if, if you can't get out, watching bird cams, webcams, nest cams, and, and you can do your birding you know, from your wheelchair at home if you, if, if you can't get out. So birding has been my salvation and I'm really happy to share my journey with people that I hope it can in, in, inspire hope in other people that have chronic illnesses. So that's it, we've come full circle and I hope now you know that the, that the proper names of these night owls and baby owls and food owls and, and plastic bags, there's no test, don't worry. Um, I don't know how much time we have left, Kelly. Um, um, if we don't get to your question, please email me. And again, my address will be in the, the email you'll get from Kelly. So again, I'd like to thank Burlington Green for this opportunity to, to share my passion. And again, Kelly, I owe you so much. Thank you for, for hosting. And thank you audience for your interest in owls and attending. And I wish you all good owling. And I'll say good ethical owling. Thanks. So I'll stop sharing, I guess, Kelly. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, 
Uh, I know you haven't been keeping an eye on the chat and you'll get to, Bob will get to look and see all of your comments that you guys made throughout the presentation. Lots of compliments on, on your photos and everyone had really positive things to say about your interesting information, your beautiful photos, lots of congratulations on, on the book. Um, so really good feedback so far, which is not surprising. Um, having heard you speak so passionately about birds and birding before, I'm not surprised that you could knock it out of the field for, um, with owls too. So, you know, I want to give my sincerest thanks to you for, for coming and joining us again and sharing your passion with us and, you know, teaching us and inspiring us. So it's, it's been wonderful. Thank you very much, Jordan. So for the folks, I think that we had about half a dozen questions that came through. We're, we're running over time. I, I didn't want to cut Bob off because he just, he does such a good job and I, I wanted to give him that chance. So he already agreed offline to um, answer any questions that we weren't able to get to and we'll include the answers in the follow-up email that will get sent out tomorrow. So I'm sorry for, for people who sent in your questions, but we will respond to them in, um, We'll get we'll get Bob res to respond to them and we'll include those in the email. And, and just before um, people go, I want to just let you know about a couple opportunities with Burlington Green. At Burlington Green, we offer a variety of awareness, advocacy and action opportunities for people just like you to join in and it makes a big impact for the planet locally. And our motto for this year is let's do this. So we've got engaging free presentations and workshops available that are great for classrooms, community groups and businesses. Tomorrow night, our friends at CORE are hosting a, uh, an important town hall meeting at 7 p.m. And our annual Clean Up Green Up event registration is going to be opening on March 12th. So we've got much more you can get involved in as well. And you can learn and find out more about all of that at burlingtongreen.org. And if you like this event, event and you want to find out more about what we have going on or upcoming opportunities, um, we do encourage everyone to sign up for our newsletter and you can stay, stay up to date on everything we've got going on. And when you exit tonight, you'll be directed to our post event survey. So your feedback is so important to us. It helps us improve the experience for future event and activities. It only takes a minute. We'd really appreciate it if you could do that. Uh, Burlington Green is a registered charity and your donations fuel the work we do in the community to help create a cleaner, greener, more environmentally responsible Burlington. Donations are appreciated. And if you're able to give, you can do so at burlingtongreen.org. And then just lastly, today's event was part of our Nature Friendly Burlington program. So a big thank you to the Burlington Foundation for making that program and tonight's event possible. So that's all that I have for tonight. Thank you again, Bob, so much for joining us again. And thank you to everyone for taking time to, to join us and, and stay with us tonight. It was an absolute pleasure. And we hope that we'll see you all again next time. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>